Welcome to Health of the World Grand Rounds. Today we welcome Dr. Fareed from UC San Diego, uh, the Neuroradiology Department. Our topic today is intracranial infections, and so please help me in welcoming her. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isaiah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rehani and the whole Health for the World team for inviting me. Um, it's my second year. Um, my second time here uh, at the Grand Rounds, and uh, I'm so excited to be here, so honored to be here. Uh, and I, um, you know, it's wonderful to connect with uh, radiology faculty, radiology trainees from across the globe. It's really uh, an honor and a privilege. So uh, thank you for joining this morning. And uh, I just want to make sure someone else will be monitoring the chat, Isaiah, in case there's any questions. Okay, wonderful. Yes, yeah, so well, I think, um, sorry, to interrupt. we'll try to save some of the questions for the end. Please okay. feel free to um, uh, ask your questions in the Q&A segment on the bottom, and we'll try to address those at the end of the discussion. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, friends, uh, I'm going to go ahead and share uh, my PowerPoint here so we can get started. Um, so Isaiah, can you just give me a thumbs up? You're able to see that? Wonderful. Okay. So today we're going to be uh, talking about intracranial infection. And as all topics, intracranial infection is a very broad topic. And we could probably spend hours and hours talking about all the different entities that can infect the central nervous system. Of, of course, we have a limited time here, maybe 45 minutes or so before we have our Q&A. So we will try in this time to touch on the most um, common um, entities and also the most common imaging patterns, which can help us when we're evaluating these patients um, to make the right diagnosis and also to uh, look for secondary complications, which oftentimes are uh, more important than, you know, uh, even the primary thing that's going on. So uh, I'm, as Isaiah mentioned, a, a professor of radiology at, at University of California, San Diego. So I have no disclosures, uh, and the outline is pretty straightforward. We'll first start by talking about infection as far as um, which compartment of the brain is being infected. So we'll go from outside and work our way in. So that's sort of our anatomically bound component. Uh, for the next component, we'll talk about a few specific pathogens of interest, uh, which may have some specific imaging patterns. And finally, we'll spend a little time at the end talking about some of the opportunistic infections that we see in HIV AIDS, but not only that, it can be in other immunocompromised states as well. And just to get everyone um, participating and everyone uh, sort of thinking as we start, uh, we're going to start with five unknown cases. And what I ask you to do is on a piece of paper or somewhere, if you can jot down uh, what you think is the most likely answer, and then we'll reveal the answers before jumping into uh, the lecture. Uh, but I think this is a nice way to get the juices flowing. And for some of them, there's a it's an amp mini, so there's one clear diagnosis. And for others, there may be a top three differential. Okay. So here is case one. And I'm not going to say much except just to say we have an axial T2, an axial T1 post contrast, and a uh, representative image from the MR spectroscopy that was performed. And you can see the numbers down here. So I'll just give maybe 15 seconds on each of these for everyone to make their most educated guess or most educated uh, diagnosis, and then we'll move on. Okay, let's look at case two. Here we have just a single axial flare image. And of course, all I should have prefaced by saying that these are all going to be intracranial infection. Okay, so of course, with some things like in this case, there may be a differential for a non infectious process. But in this case, uh, in all five of these, it's going to be an infection. So that should help narrow the narrow the diagnosis. <clears throat> 
Okay, we'll go on to case three. Uh, here we have a single axial T1 post contrast image at the level of the midbrain. And of course, I'm not providing you much history because I already told you that these are all infection. So, uh, you know, so you can guess the history, right? Fever, headache, uh, maybe altered mental status. Okay, case four is a single axial flare image. This one is a little bit more of an eye test. So I um, will direct your eyes to the region of the left sylvian fissure and also to the atrium of the right lateral ventricle. And finally, case five is a single axial T2 image at the level of the basal ganglia. Okay, so again, I apologize for not giving more time, but we're gonna go ahead and look at the answers um, to be revealed now. So our first case was a cerebral abscess. Case two was an HSV encephalitis. Case three was a TB meningitis, but of course there was a differential uh, for uh, fungal, uh, different fungal uh, meningitides could have a similar appearance. Case four was a neurocystrocercosis. And case, case five was a cryptococcal meningitis with gelatinous pseudocysts in the basal ganglia. Okay, so I'm sure everyone got 100%. And now we can uh, jump into our um, topic. So we'll start again with the anatomically bound intracranial infection. And I think this is a nice diagram just to remind us that the same way that we think about hemorrhage, that hemorrhage can be in various compartments of the brain, epidural, subdural, subarachnoid, uh, intraparenchymal and intraventricular, infection is the same. So we can think of it as epidural, um, you know, an epidural abscess, a subdural abscess, or empyema. Um, if it gets into the leptomeninges, then we're dealing with the leptomeningitis. If it gets into the parenchyma, we can have a brain abscess or an encephalitis. Uh, and of course, here in this diagram, it doesn't show the ventricles, but of course, if it gets into the ventricles, then we have a ventriculitis. So it's a very um, same kind of thought process as with hemorrhage, we can think of infection. Okay, so let's get started. Um, here we have uh, two axial T2 images. And uh, what I want to point out here is we have a small um, lentiform shaped uh, collection along the right frontal convexity. And the important thing to recognize here is that the adjacent right frontal sinus is quite opacified. Uh, there's a lot of uh, inflammatory change uh, within that sinus. As we look uh, further, we have an axial DWI and axial ADC. Um, the axial ADC is a little bit um, motion degraded, but we can see that there is a restricted diffusion within this collection. So we know that there's something there that's different than fluid. And then when we look at a post contrast images, we see marked pachymeningeal enhancement, so enhancement of the dura, as well as marked leptomeningeal enhancement of the underlying uh, leptomeningeal space. So this is a very nice example of a small epidural empyema uh, that has um, uh, come about as a result of this right frontal sinusitis. So this is a beautiful diagram from StatDX showing exactly what we saw, but on a sagittal, um, again, seeing the sinusitis and then the erosion through the bone uh, to form this epidural uh, collection along the right frontal convexity. So again, uh, we see that here. So the important thing to remember with epidural empyemas is that they're usually coming from a, an adjacent source. So whether that's the sinuses, whether that's the mastoids, whether that's the calvarium because of an osteomyelitis, it's usually coming directly from an adjacent source. 
These need um, usually surgical drainage. Of course, this one was quite small, so perhaps this could be treated and, and watched, uh, but uh, of course they need to be watched very closely um, because there is a relatively high mortality rate. Okay, let's move on. Uh, we have an axial T1 post contrast image. And uh, I know there's a lot going on, but I'll draw your attention to a couple of collections here. And these collections uh, look different um, than our last collection. It's more crescentic shaped, as we would expect something in the subdural space to be. Um, and it's not only here along the temporal convexity, we have a little bit here. Uh, also along the anterior temporal convexity, and then we have part of this collection along the prepontine cistern. And then when we look further on our DWN ADC, we see that these collections, again, have restricted diffusion. So again, this is not fluid. There's something uh, else in there. In this case, it's, it's pus. And this is a case of subdural empyema. Now, this case was interesting because you may have already noticed those astute amongst us that there's something very wrong with the right orbit. So this patient started out actually as a very bad case of orbital cellulitis. And this orbital cellulitis, as you can see, um, there's uh, marked epi-scleral um, thickening and enhancement surrounding that globe. But um, even more importantly, we're seeing some very concerning signs in that superior ophthalmic vein. It's not enhancing. So we have um, thrombosis of that superior ophthalmic vein as a result of the infection. That's also working its way into the cavernous sinuses where we have various filling defects. Okay, so we don't have homogeneous enhancement of the cavernous sinuses. And for those of you who've been searching, this is also extended into the dural venous sinuses where we see a thrombosis of the left transverse sinus. So this was a very serious orbital cellulitis which had worked its way back um, with um, associated um, uh, venous thrombosis uh, of the superior ophthalmic vein, cavernous sinuses, dural venous sinus, and um, associated uh, subdural empyemas. So pretty extensive infection. Okay, just a couple of um, uh, comments. Um, subdural empyemas can also come from a direct source um, or it can be more hematogenous spread, okay? Or it can come about as a result of a leptomeningitis. Complications, uh, venous thrombosis, which we saw an example of, or if it uh, ruptures into the brain parenchyma, of course, there can be a cerebral abscess. The differential for a subdural empyema is other subdural processes like a like a subdural hematoma or a subdural effusion, but the difference, of course, is that with a subdural. Uh, um, hematoma or effusion normally we shouldn't see that marked restricted diffusion um, that we would see in the setting of a subdural empyema you can see some with a chronic subdural hematoma, but it shouldn't be um, as um, marked as you see with a subdural empyema. Okay, moving on, now we're, we keep going inwards. Now we're in the subarachnoid space. Um, so you can see here uh, in this single axial T1 post contrast image, we have abnormal enhancement within our sylvian fissures. Uh, within some of the parieto occipital sulci along the anterior interhemispheric fissure. Um, and this is a case of leptomeningitis. Now, I want to make an important point here is that many times there will be a patient with meningitis, um, especially if it's a, um, you know, possibly a viral meningitis or even a bacterial meningitis, and we may see not much on imaging. We may actually look um, at a relatively normal uh, head CT or MRI of the brain. And so, of course, um, note, remembering that the diagnosis here is based on the CSF analysis, not based on our imaging. But the main reason that the imaging is obtained is to look for secondary complications, okay? And um, again, with a meningitis, the source is usually hematogenous. 
And imaging findings will vary. We're going to look at some other cases of basilar meningitis, which look different than what we're seeing here. They're much more concentrated in the basal cisterns. But the important thing I want you to remember is that imaging can be normal um, in some cases. And so our job, again, is to look for the secondary complications like hydrocephalus due to obstruction um, of CSF resorption at the level of the arachnoid granulations, uh, potentially infarcts, uh, venous thrombosis again, uh, cerebral abscess and ventriculitis. So some of these same complications are going to come up again and again. And of course, if I didn't give you the history uh, that this patient was coming in with fever, uh, an elevated white count potentially, um, there is a differential, of course, with um, carcinomatous meningitis. So if this patient had a history of breast cancer without fever, then we have a very different um, differential. Um, or another entity to keep in mind is neurosarcoidosis, which can um, uh, manifest itself in many different ways, but one of those ways is a um, leptomeningeal enhancement. Okay, so this was our first unknown. So we have, um, again, axial T2 and flare, and we see this uh, round lesion. One of the key points I want to point out is the dark T2 rim surrounding this lesion, which is uh, one of the um, signs we look for in this entity. We have marked edema. On the post-contrast images, we see uh, uniform peripheral enhancement and central um, non-enhancement. And then with our DWN ADC, we can see that this lesion is centrally restricted. Okay, and so I'm sure that many of you, as you were looking at this, are thinking about that acronym that we often hear, which is MAGIC DOCTOR, uh, and this is one of the, um, and that acronym is for rim enhancing lesions, and this is one of those uh, entities, it's the A in MAGIC, which is, of course, a cerebral abscess. And then the spectroscopy was confirmatory in this case, we had a uh, nice um, single voxel spectroscopy, and we can see our some of our normal metabolites that we look for, NAA at 2, creatine at 3, and choline at 3.2. But what's important in this case is we're also seeing lactate, and of course lactate is not very specific uh, because it's just telling us that there's something anaerobic going on, and that can be with really with any necrotic process. Uh, however, the metabolites here that are more uh, important are these amino acid metabolites, acetate at 1.9, succinate at 2.4. And these amino acid peaks are actually quite specific uh, for a um, abscess. So important to look for those and MR spectroscopy can be employed if there's any question uh, about the diagnosis. And then along the same lines, um, there is a uh, continuum of development of a cerebral abscess. Um, sometimes it may not start as a frank abscess to begin with. Sometimes it may begin like this. So this was a patient that came in with some altered mental status. Um, I don't remember if he had fever, but there wasn't um, you know, there was uh, clinic, there was clinical uncertainty about what what was going on with him. And so we have the axial flare, the axial post contrast, there is not much enhancement. Uh, and then on the axial DW on ADC, we see a little bit of restricted diffusion within this area. Um, so you know, this patient, again, like I said, was having um, altered mental status, and I think he was having some seizures as well. And um, the uh, clinicians who were looking at him were quite concerned that this was a low-grade glioma, a non-enhancing low-grade glioma. So this patient, they actually went for biopsy, and this ended up being cerebritis. So it's important to remember on our differential um, that cerebritis, when there's inflammation of that brain parenchyma, but it hasn't developed a frank abscess, can look sometimes a little bit confusing. It can look like 
Um, in this case, the thought was potentially a low grade glioma. So very important to keep it on our differential. Um, and, um, you know, perhaps this patient could have been treated and followed up rather than being subjected to a biopsy. But um, in any case, they did get the answer and they were able to treat him um, accordingly. So a couple of uh, um, comments about cerebritis and cerebral abscess, that spectrum. Um, it's usually hematogenous, but of course you can develop them iatrogenically if there's been maybe some instrumentation of the brain parenchyma. Um, and of course, in the setting of uh, potentially penetrating trauma. There's many different pathogens. A couple that I've highlighted here that just to keep in mind, of course, we're not responsible to tell them what the pathogen is, but, um, uh, but we can be aware that in diabetics, um, one of the pathogens that are more common is Klebsiella, and in the post-transplant patient, um, nocardia. And again, our job is to look for any complications. So this abscess has not yet ruptured into the ventricles, but if it does, then of course the patient would be at risk of developing ventriculitis. Uh, and of course there was significant edema and local mass effect, but this patient was not herniating um, yet. So they were able to um, take care of him before this created any more significant complications. And again, remembering that um, acronym quickly uh, going through the acronym for rib enhancing lesion. We think about metastases. Um, we think about abscess. GBM can sometimes present as a rib enhancing mass. Um, infarct. Uh, now, infarct especially in the subacute phase can enhance. Usually it's not a beautiful ring. It's going to be more gyriform, um, but just to keep that in mind, contusion. Uh, so if there's uh, some kind of hemorrhage in the brain, again, in the subacute phase, um, there can be enhancement at the rim because of the breakdown of the blood brain barrier. And um, sorry, one second here. Oh, did I stop sharing Isaiah? No, I can still see the screen. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. I had a little uh, error message that popped up. Um, uh, and then the, the second A is just to remember AIDS related um, infections such as toxo. Uh, the L is for lymphoma. Again, in the, in the setting of an immunocompromised patient, um, it can be rim enhancing. D is for demyelination, like a tumefactive demyelinating lesion. And R is for radiation necrosis. So it's a very long one. I'm sure you guys have all learned it, um, but we do want to try to narrow our differential based on the clinical history, but also what the enhancement really looks like. Okay, let's um, move on. So now we're in the brain parenchyma. We talked about cerebritis, cerebral abscess. We're still in the brain parenchyma, but now we're dealing with a more diffuse multifocal process rather than something that's more localized. So we have three axial flare images. This was our case two, our unknown case two was this image. And you can see here um, in this patient coming in also with fever and altered mental status that there's specific areas of the brain that are involved and we really need to be able to pick those up. So we see that there's involvement of the mesial temporal lobe and hippocampus. That's probably the most obvious area. But additionally, I've tried to window this so we can see the other areas of involvement, including the insula including the cingulate gyrus, the inferior frontal lobe, and in this case, there's some thalamic involvement as well. But the overwhelming um, pattern is that there's something affecting the limbic system, okay? And when we see that, we want to um, um, rule out HSV encephalitis until proven otherwise. And the reason that that's so important, as I'm sure you guys know, is that this um, uh, diagnosis carries a uh, high potential morbidity and even mortality, if not treated promptly. So if we see a pattern that is suggestive of HSV encephalitis, even if we're not sure, we want to bring it up because we wanna make sure that the patient is worked up for that. And also that 
if it fits with the clinical picture that they treat that they start treatment promptly with a cyclovir because that prompt treatment can actually save the patient um, both morbidity wise and mortality wise so very very important to recognize this pattern here's another example of an hsv encephalitis um, that looks a little bit different and again we see the involvement of the right temporal lobe but in this case the patient um, had not been treated uh, very promptly and so had developed a uh, pretty marked hemorrhagic uh, um, change within that right temporal lobe. So this is all susceptibility on the GRE sequence. So these are all areas of hemorrhage. And then they had also developed a little bit of um, uh, enhancement within that region. So this is another example of HSV encephalitis. And then thinking about encephalitides, I also wanted to just show this example from the literature. I don't have an example of Japanese encephalitis myself, but this is a nice example from the literature showing the marked involvement of the bilateral thalami and hippocampi on these axial flare images. And why did I show this particular encephalitis? Um, because um, first of all, encephalitis, as we mentioned, is a diffuse inflammation of the brain parenchyma, but I wanted to, of course, pin at HSV because it's the most common sporadic encephalitis, and remember to look for that limbic system involvement and bring up that diagnosis right away. Um, and then Japanese encephalitis is the most common endemic form of encephalitis but of course we see it less you know depending on you know where we live um, but other of course there's many other viruses that can cause uh, encephalitis ebv west nile eastern equine and they all have um, various patterns um, that we should be familiar with um, but i just wanted to point out um, a couple of the more common types and then remember that you know, uh, if I just showed you this one image, of course, a differential that would be very reasonable is, oh, this patient looks like they have a glioma, right? There's mass-like flare hyperintensity um, in that mesotemporal lobe and hippocampus. And so uh, if you didn't see the multifocal involvement and, and know the history of the patient, then of course, you may go down that route. And then with the basal ganglia and thalamic involvement, there's also a differential. Of course, many toxic and metabolic events can involve the, met, um, the thalami, but important to keep viral encephalitis on your differential for basal ganglia involvement. And then finally, we've now come into the most deep part of the brain, which is the ventricles. And so here we have an axial CT and axial flare image showing that there's um, a moderately dilated ventricular system, which is um, uh, very abnormal in this patient who's only about 30 years old. Um, so this is markedly abnormal. And not only that, but we have this extensive periventricular flare hyperintensity. Um, and for those of you who are paying attention, there's also parenchymal involvement in several locations. This patient wasn't stable enough to even get contrast, so I don't have the post-contrast images in this case. But I do have some additional axial T2 and flare lower down, and you can see within the ventricle there's all of these adhesions or synechiae that have formed because this patient has uh, pus um, and infection within the ventricle. So this is an example of ventriculitis. I will show you another example where we do have post-contrast images to show the periventricular enhancement um, involving the lateral ventricles. We also see enhancement encasing the medulla and uh, with leptomeningeal involvement of the cerebellum. And then when we look at the DWI and ADC images, we can see beautifully the layering pus within the ventricle, uh, within the ventricles, as well as within the fourth ventricle. So this is all layering pus. Ventriculitis is very important to recognize because it too has a very high mortality rate. 
um, and uh, you know needs to be treated um, as soon as possible. Um, why do people get ventriculitis? Well, certainly if an abscess ruptures into the ventricle, that's one cause. Um, in the setting of meningitis that gets into the ventricular system, this is more common in neonates, but that's another cause. And of course, iatrogenic. The second case I showed you was actually uh, an iatrogenic cause. The patient had had a suboccipital craniectomy um, and uh, unfortunately, um, there had been some um, introduction of infection um, at that time, and that's uh, when the patient developed this marked ventriculitis. Okay, so that takes us to the end of that first component, which is our largest component of the lecture, which is the anatomically bound infection. We'll now, um, in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes go through some few specific pathogens. Um, so this was case three that I showed you, an axial T1 post contrast image, and we see this thick enhancing um, process involving the uh, basal um, cisterns. And so, as I mentioned during the unknowns, there is a differential for a basal or meningitis. And we will talk about that. In this case, it happened to be TB, basilar meningitis. Um, before we talk about that differential, I wanted to show another example of TB, but in this case, it's a tuberculoma. So what we have here is a um, rim enhancing lesion in the left cerebellum, but it has a very, very thick uh, wall. And interestingly, the central aspect of it is not so bright. It's more T2 ISO intense, which is one of the things that is more unique about the TB because it's more of a granulomatous process. So you don't have frank pus in the middle of the tuberculoma, but you have more of this granulomatous process. So these are both cases of uh, CNS infection with TB, but involving different areas. So the source is usually, of course, as we all know from the lung, and in on imaging, we look for that thick enhancing basilar exudate, but with a tuberculoma, we can also look for a solid or rim enhancing mass. And then I didn't show you an example of this, but you can also, of course, get just dural thickening like a pachy meningitis as well. Um, so that's another imaging pattern we could look for. And again, as with all of our cases, we want to look for those secondary complications. Um, now, the uh, I didn't uh, mention the differential for a thick basilar meningitis yet, but here is an example. So here's another patient, and here we see even more pronounced um, thick enhancing exudate surrounding our midbrain, as well as along the MCA fissures and um, within the supracellar cistern. So this was not a case of TB, but rather a case of coxy meningitis. So you can see that the imaging pattern between TB and fungal meningitis can be very similar. Um, so we have to provide a differential. And so this is a sporadic fungal infection caused by C. imitis. It's also um, usually from hematogenous spread. Uh, CNS involvement is actually quite common. And where I live in San Diego, California, we see this a fair amount because this is uh, much more common in the Southwest USA, but also in some other areas like Northern Mexico and South America. So depending on where we live, sometimes we see some pathogens more than others. So for example, we don't see much Lyme disease here in um, Southern California, but in the Northeast of the United States, it's very different. So. We have to also take that into account. And then I also talked about the differential with TB and also remembering neurosarcoid, which can also give you a basilar um, meningitis. Okay, so moving on to another pathogen of interest. Here we have axial T2, axial flare, and axial T1 post contrast images. And what we see is really quite subtle maybe on first glance, but we're seeing what looks like a cystic lesion along that right 
uh, I'm sorry, left frontal uh, convexity. And for those of you who are very astute, you can see that within that cyst, we see a little dot of flare hyperintensity, okay? Let's look at a couple other images. This was actually our unknown case four. And so this is the same patient. And again, on the T2, maybe a little bit subtle, but we see that there's some process going on in the sylvian fissure. Maybe we also see some enlargement of the atrium of the right lateral ventricle. And then on the flare, again, we see these cysts with uh, uh, little dots of flare within them. And then on the post contrast, we see a little bit of enhancement of the wall of that cyst. So as you guys may have guessed, this is an example of neurocystrocercosis. This is something else that we see, uh, you know, not uncommonly in San Diego because of our proximity to the border, um, because this is fa fairly endemic actually in Mexico. So here is actually the same patient, um, but I wanted to show these images as well because one particular form of neurocystrocercosis um, can involve the basal cisterns and can give you these grape-like uh, cysts within the basal cisterns. And so you can see here these uh, cysts. Again, on the T2, it's maybe a little hard to appreciate, but on the flare, you can see the wall of the cyst. And again, that little scolex uh, within it, that's the little worm. Um, and uh, on the post contrast, just a little bit of enhancement. So this is the racemose type of neurocystrocercosis. Okay, so this is a parasitic infection caused by the pork tape uh, worm Tinea solium. It comes from eating the uncooked uh, pork. And there's four stages. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time, but just remembering that the first stage, which is the vesicular stage, where we see just the cyst and the scolex, sometimes it can be hard to see because there's not much of an inflammatory process around it but once it um our body recognizes that this is uh you know something that needs to be dealt with and um it it goes into the colloidal vesicular stage then we see the edema and the enhancement and this is when patients um, often present with seizures seizures is the most common um you know, presentation often. And then as the edema and enhancement sort of uh, quiets down, you get into the granular nodular phase. And then finally, in the chronic stage, you'll just see calcifications. And that'll be the chronic stage of neurocystrocercosis. We talked about the racemose type in the, um, that we saw here in the um, uh, cerebellopontine angle cistern. Okay, and then moving on to another pathogen of interest, which um, is to me probably the most interesting. So we have here two axial T2 images. This is a patient without the typical history that I've, we've talked about, which is fever or um, you know seizure or ultramental size. This is a patient with rapidly progressive um, dementia, and so when we see. Uh, this kind of picture where we see a rapidly progressive decline and we see involvement of the basal ganglia. Now the involvement of the basal ganglia can be a little subtle because it's bilateral, but here, here you see abnormal T2 hyperintensity within the bilateral putamina and caudate. And if I show you the DWI, it's much more obvious that we have involvement of our caudate or putamina as well as our thalami in a very distinct pattern. You may even call it a hockey stick pattern, okay, with involvement of the pulvinar nucleus and the dorsal medial nucleus of the thalamus. So as some of you may have, may have guessed, this is an example of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease or CJD. Here is another example which I find quite interesting. Uh, here we have axial flare images where again, the finding is quite subtle. Maybe you could say there's a little bit of flare um, in the caudate and putamen. Um, maybe the sulci here are a little bit effaced compared to this side, but very subtle. And then we look at the DWI and we see, wow, again, there is this marked restricted diffusion within those basal ganglia right greater than left 
And in this case, we have diffuse cortical involvement uh, of the right cerebral hemisphere. So this is called the cortical ribbon sign. So this is another example of CJD. So what is CJD or Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease? It's a rapidly progressive and, and fatal dementia caused by a prion. So it's not a virus, it's not a bacteria, it's not a fungus, it's not a parasite, it's a prion, okay? And um, the incidence is, you know, it's fairly uncommon, thankfully, um, but, uh, you know, when we do see it, um, the sporadic form um, is the most common. There's also a familial form and a variant form, um, but the sporadic is most common. Uh, and with the imaging, a couple of the signs we talked about, that hockey stick sign within the thalamus, um, as well as the cortical ribbon sign um, within the uh, cerebral cortex. So very important to recognize um, because, you know, the, our neuro, you know, neurology colleagues may not always be thinking about this diagnosis. So it's important for us to bring it up if we see imaging findings. So again, the importance of the DWI in these cases, okay? Uh, we're running a little short of time, so let's just go through these others quickly. So uh, as you all know, we've, we're still in this worldwide pandemic. Of course, things are much better now than they were, you know, two years ago. But, uh, you know, when we were first dealing with um, uh, COVID-19, we actually saw many, many cases of, of neuro-COVID. Um, and neurocovid can have many different manifestations. Here's a couple of examples from the uh, AJNR that I just wanted to show you guys. So one pattern that was shown was this sort of diffuse um, uh, flare hyperintensity, a leukoencephalopathy involving the deep white matter uh, with associated restricted diffusion. Uh, another pattern was these um, uh, numerous micro hemorrhages. Uh, micro hemorrhages were pretty commonly seen within the splenium uh, as well as along the gray white matter junction. Here we also see some abnormal flare within the splenium. So this was another example of COVID. And so, um, uh, you know, just I'll talk about this very briefly. Of course, now we're seeing much less of the neuro COVID than we were seeing earlier on in the pandemic. But um, uh, some of the findings we saw, of course, the patients um, had some hypercoagulability, so we would see arterial infarctions, we would see venous thromboses, I didn't show example of that, but then um, within the brain parenchyma, we would see microhemorrhages and leukoencephalopathy. And with the leukoencephalopathy, it was relatively deep and symmetric with sparing of the subcortical U fibers, okay? All right, and then in the last five minutes here, we'll just talk briefly about some specific opportunistic infection. Again, not only in the HIV AIDS population, but really in immunocompromised patients in general. <clears throat> so um, at first glance, this actually looks similar, right, to what we were just seeing with the COVID-19, but this is a patient who has uh, longstanding uh, HIV, and we can see a couple of things. Um, we can see that the patient has atrophy. I didn't give you the age, but this is a, a, a 45 year old. And so the ventricles are much bigger than we would expect. The sulci are a little bit enlarged as well. So there's atrophy. Um, and then there's this diffuse, again, symmetric involvement of the white matter. Um, again, much more than we would expect from just chronic white matter changes in a 40 something. And so this is actually the effect of the HI uh, of the virus itself on the brain parenchyma. So it's not a secondary infection, but the um, the human immunodeficiency virus itself and its effects on the white matter, um, as well as resulting in diffuse atrophy. Um, and so uh, the Neurologically, this is called the AIDS dementia complex, and it's, a, again, the direct affection of HIV on the brain. We look for atrophy and diffuse white matter T2 hyperintensity with no associated mass effect or enhancement. 
Now, a main differential we think about is PML, which is progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. So let's look at that. These are some axial flare images. And here we see a very different pattern. Rather than seeing symmetric, deep involvement of the white matter, here we're seeing more peripheral and patchy involvement with, with extension into the subcortical U fibers. Okay, so it's a very different pattern. And um, this patient had a CD4 less than 100. Here's another example of a PML with involvement of the right middle cerebellar peduncle. And what I wanted to show you here is really um, seeing that normally PML should have no associated enhancement. This is a post contrast or mass effect. Okay, under normal circumstances. Uh, and we'll see an exception to that in just a minute. So PML, it's a progressive demyelinating disorder caused by the JC virus. Again, the CD4 is usually quite low. And again, looking for the patchy asymmetric involvement of the white matter and the involvement of the subcortical U fibers. Again, under normal circumstances, no mass effect or enhancement. Okay. Oh, before we get to the exception, um, there's another uh, opportunistic infection to talk about. So we have a T1 post contrast flare and DWI image. We see sort of a rim enhancing lesion, but it's very irregular um, within the uh, centered in the right thalamus. Uh, there's significant edema, mass effect. You can see the third ventricle is effaced. And interestingly, no diffusion restriction. So we're not thinking that this is a typical pyogenic or bacterial abscess uh, because it, it has a odd shape and there's no restricted diffusion. So what's going on? So this patient went on to get spectroscopy as well. We had another example of spectroscopy earlier. And here we're seeing a very specific elevated peak um, for those of you who have uh, some familiarity with MR spectroscopy, this is a lipid peak. Um, it's often a lipid slash lactate peak. It's hard to differentiate, but it's um, uh, or hard to separate those peaks sometimes. But we can see that this is um, sort of ranging from 0.9 to 1.4. And this lipid peak is actually quite uh, specifically seen in the setting of this entity, which is toxoplasmosis. So quick comment on this. This is the actually the most common opportunistic infection in AIDS. It's caused by the parasite Toxoplasma gondii. Again, CD4 is usually quite low. Some things to look for are the eccentric target sign, and I'll show you an example of that later. This was not an example of that, but remember that the eccentric target sign is specific but not sensitive, so many cases will not have it. Um, involvement as far as uh, where it likes to involve, it's usually the basal ganglia and thalami. And on MR spectroscopy, again, we can look for this lipid peak. Now, in an HIV patient, something else that can um, be a differential here for a basal ganglia rim enhancing lesion is lymphoma. So this can often cause a diagnostic dilemma. And one of the things that can be employed is a nuclear medicine thallium scan, which will show um, activity with lymphoma, but not with um, toxoplasmosis. But another thing that is often done is the patient is just treated empirically for the toxoplasmosis. And if the patient improves and the imaging improves, then they we know the diagnosis. If the patient doesn't improve, then they would consider doing the brain biopsy um, to confirm lymphoma. So, so oftentimes that's, you know, what will be employed is empiric treatment. Okay, and then um, another opportunistic infection, this was our last unknown case. These are all axial T2 images. And the, the striking abnormality here is you see lots of tiny, 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 tiny little cystic lesions within the caudate and putamina, as well as within the cerebral peduncles. Uh, and if I told you that this patient has a history of um, HIV, um, this pattern should make you think of, oh, this is to show that there's a little bit of edema, but no enhancement. 
And this pattern should make you think of cryptococcus. So cryptococcus, again, usually hematogenous spread from the lung. And the pattern that we're seeing are these gelatinous pseudocysts within the basal ganglia. This is a very sort of classic pattern, but it can also give you more of a miliary uh, parenchymal pattern or leptomeningeal pattern. And you can also get a rim enhancing lesion like the tuberculoma called a cryptococcoma. So there's different patterns, okay? And then this is what I was referring to before I said that I'd show you an example of toxoplasmosis with the eccentric target sign. So this is an example of that. Um, and we see edema around it. Here's another lesion uh, posterior to the splenium with edema and enhancement. But the reason I'm showing you another case of toxo is to point out that this patient after starting their antiretroviral therapy, um, the imaging findings significantly worsened. We see more, we see the lesions got larger, there's more enhancement, and now there's lots of edema. And so what this is called is iris or immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome in the setting of toxo. And we'll talk about what that means, but I'll show you one other example of iris. But in this case, it's a patient with PML. So we see a PML lesion in the right middle cerebellar peduncle. Like I told you, usually no mass effect, no enhancement. But in this case, again, after the patient started their antiretroviral therapy, they developed a lot of enhancement and a lot of edema uh, associated with this lesion. So this is another example of iris, but in the setting of PML. So what is immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome? It's when we get a paradoxical worsening of opportunistic infections in the setting of HIV AIDS following the onset of their antiretroviral therapy. So when their immune system is reconstituted, uh, there's more of a marked response in the brain with the underlying opportunistic infection, and that can actually cause a worsening in the patient's clinical status, even though their CD4 count is going up. So what is the um, treatment? Well, the main thing is to treat the underlying infection, which in this case was toxo or PML, um, and then let that be treated and then restart, you know, the antiretroviral therapy. Okay, so that was a whirlwind. I'm so sorry, but we do have a few minutes. Uh, in summary here, uh, just quickly, these are the, some of the entities we discussed today. And um, again, I'm uh, here's my email and this is my Twitter uh, handle. Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I would love to connect with um, other, again, faculty or trainees uh, from across the globe. And this is my family. Uh, and here's a picture of uh, beautiful San Diego, California. So I will stop share at this point um, so we can uh, address any uh, questions. Thank you, Dr. Fried. That was a, an excellent lecture. And I really appreciated the, uh, the cases that you had. From. They're really good. Um, we do have a few questions here. Uh, one is Dr. Erhan B. B. Um, and it, uh, the question is, how long does the enhancement continue after treatment of cerebri cerebritis or abscess? And then does enhancement uh, indicate active infection despite normalized APR after treatment? Okay. And I'm sorry, what, what does uh, APR stand for? Do they want to chat, put it in the chat? Okay, but in any case, I'll, I'll, let's talk about the first part first. So, um, you know, how long the enhancement continues after treatment of cerebritis or abscess? I, I don't actually have a good answer for that. Um, you know, I, I can tell you that, it, you know, if it's, if it's not, um, you know, the, if the abscess is not causing significant mass effect or herniation, um, then they may try to treat the patient, um, you know, more conservatively with IV antibiotics. Um, if, of course, there's any sign of um, it being close to the ventricles and with the risk of rupture or any kind of herniation or mass effect, then they will go in to directly evacuate it. So if they, of course, go in directly to evacuate it, that's a different story. But if they treat it more conservatively with just IV antibiotics, 
Um, I'm actually not sure about the timeline, but I would imagine, uh, you know, anecdotally from what we do, we would get at least repeat imaging while the patient is still in house before any kind of discharge. So we would get repeat imaging, let's say in a few days or, you know, uh, so just to make sure at least the imaging findings are improving. Okay, so that would be um, the main take home is that before discharging, you want to make sure that the imaging findings are improving. Um, it. It oh, like and it was acute fun. phase, acute phase reactants. I see, I see. Um, so yeah, and and it's true, just like in the spine, that uh, you know the um, Im the improvement of imaging findings can definitely lag the improvement in clinical findings. So I think that's what Erhan is trying to get at. Sometimes the imaging finding improvement can lag, and that's absolutely true. So we don't want to treat based on the imaging, but based on clinically. However, like I said, um, I would always say to get a follow-up imaging prior to discharge if they're not going to go in to drain the abscess because you want to make sure at least it's not getting any bigger and to make sure that there's no secondary complication, again, ventriculitis or hydrocephalus or something like that. Excellent. Thank you. The next question we have is um, how long are we able to appreciate DWI bright signals in kreutzfeldt jakob disease? Uh, and are there any stages? Um, another very good question about timing that um, uh, I probably don't have, a, again, a clear answer to. Um, you know, when we image these patients, uh, when they first come in with this rapidly progressive symptoms, um, the DWI is definitely one of the key sequences we look at. Um, because these patients, um, you know, often are, um, you know, rapidly declining, they're not necessarily getting a lot of follow up imaging. So I don't, again, I'm not sure if it will persist, let's say a month later or two months later, because there's really, there's really not much of a treatment for it, right. And so, um, you know, so I, I would imagine that it would persist because I don't think that there would be any reason for it to go away. Now, you may recall that uh, with CJD, uh, you know, they can do a brain biopsy if necessary, but they try to avoid it. Um, and, and the reason is that the normal sterilization path, the normal sterilization techniques that are used in the OR do not work for prion, right? And so it's actually a very um, complicated process if they're actually going to go in. And so we try to make the diagnosis non-invasively based on imaging, CSF, uh, looking for things like the 1433 protein and other things that are more recent, um, and then also looking for a characteristic EEG abnormalities um, because going in. But again, unfortunately, these patients, there's no, not much treatment and they rapidly progress. And so uh, I would imagine that the DWI would persist. Mm -hmm. um, more questions here. Uh, how to identify subtle meningitis? Is it always possible to identify it? Yeah, good question. And and the qu answer for that, I can say for sure, is no. Um, we, like I said, imaging with meningitis can absolutely be normal. And so a subtle case, a patient comes in with a viral menin, you know, just a, a, a standard viral meningitis, we may see nothing on imaging. So it's okay to say, you know, that uh, there's no MR evidence of of um, meningitis related complications. We don't want to say there's no image of uh, no evidence of meningitis because the patient already probably has a positive CSF, right? But but for our standpoint, again, our main job as the radiologist is to look for the secondary complications, the hydrocephalus. Um, the arterial infarcts, the venous thrombosis. Um, so with just leptomeningitis, we may or may not see any findings on imaging, especially if it's not a TB or, or fungal meningitis, which is different. But a normal viral meningitis, we may not see much going on, um, but we shouldn't, you know, that shouldn't concern us. We should just, again, be looking for the secondary complications. <clears throat> 
we have a few questions on, um, it looks like uh, HSV encephalitis or limbic encephalitis. It's, how do you differentiate viral encephalitis from the acute presentation of uh, neuromatabolic diseases? And then uh, there's also a question of how to approach mesial temporal hyperintensities, how to differentiate from autoimmune involvement. Oh, yes, very good. So I, I absolutely, and I, yes, like you said, those are related questions because the viral encephalitides and specifically um, the HSV encephalitis, which likes to involve the mesial temporal lobe, there's definitely a, a differential, right? And 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 so one of the things you guys brought up is autoimmune, right? Autoimmune uh, or perineoplastic encephalitides. Um, for example, those that are associated with ovarian teratomas, those also like to involve the limbic system. So, um, so I absolutely agree with you that that differentiation may be difficult. However, if it if HSV encephalitis is in our differential, we must mention it. We must pick up the phone and let the clinicians know, because even if we can't be a hundred percent sure but it's in our differential, we want to let them know because we want to have them treat, you know, it's not going to hurt the patient to treat them with acyclovir. And it's better to treat with acyclovir empirically while you do the workup. Because for example, the autoimmune panel uh, for autoimmune encephalitis, it takes a while to come back. I, I don't know about your institutions, but I know at UCSD, it, it doesn't come back right away. And so you don't want to wait until you have a definitive answer. You want to treat empirically for HSV with acyclovir because you can really, again, help the patient and save the patient. Um, but you're right, glioma, I brought up the glioma as a differential, but certainly perineoplastic or limbic encephalitis uh, is another uh, differential for sure to consider with involvement of the limbic system. Um, and in regards to uh, metabolic diseases that involve the basal ganglia, yes, that's again a differential when we're looking at basal ganglia involvement. If you look on StatDx, I think this is so funny, when if you look at T2 involvement of the basal ganglia, you'll see almost a laundry list of differentials. So basal ganglia involvement uh, is something that uh, is important to identified, but also to remember for sure that there is a wide differential hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, you know, uh, toxic things like carbon monoxide and methanol, um, uh, you know, things like ADEM like to involve your basal ganglia, um, PM, uh, not PML, but um, uh, osmotic demyelination. So, you know, there's definitely a differential, but looking for the pattern of involvement can help. For example, we know that carbon monoxide likes the globus pallidus or methanol likes the putamen. So to try to look at some of those patterns in the context of the patient's clinical history as well. So. Great, thank you. I, I believe that was um, addressing the, how do you differentiate HSV encephalitis from limbic encephalitis? So, mm -hmm. um, and then, the next question I have is, what are the consequences of calcified lesions in neurocystic Um, Good question. Really, I don't think there's much consequences from the calcified lesion. So again, we live somewhere here in San Diego where we'll see um, incidental parenchymal calcifications in, on head CTs quite commonly. Um, and uh, we don't always know for sure, but we say that this could be the sequela of chronic neurosister sarcosis. But the calcified lesion, once it's in that uh, calcified nodular stage, there's really no symptomatic, um, you know, uh, there's no correlation with symptoms. You know, there it's chronic, you know, the calcification is there, it really doesn't seem to affect the patient. So it's really that colloidal vesicular stage, the stage two, and also the stage three, uh, where you have the enhancement and edema, that's when the patients often present with seizures or headaches or things like that. The chronic phase, you can mention it, but you know, it doesn't really mean much clinically. Uh, next question I have is, uh, best MRI sequence to differentiate uh, TB versus bacterial abscess? Well, uh, 
I would say if I had to choose one, you know, definitely DWI is very helpful because again, the DWI with the pyogenic abscess, so a bacterial pyogenic abscess is going to give you marked restricted diffusion. And you tend to not see that with tuberculoma or with toxoplasmosis and things like that. So if I had to choose one, I would probably say the DWI, but of course uh, the MR spectroscopy can be helpful too. But of course that's, you know, uh, for if you're able to do the more advanced imaging. And then the next question, I think there's like two components of this one. Um, could CMV occur as opportunistic infection? If yes, any characteristic findings? And I believe that's further sort of specified here. Is CMV infection common in HIV aid setting? If yes, any specific yeah, ag excellent question. I, and you're making a good point that I didn't cover CMV and I did put a disclaimer at the beginning that I couldn't cover everything. Um, and the reason I didn't involve CMV as much is that, you know, uh, with CMV, there's definitely, um, we can see uh, ocular involvement with CMV. Um, we can see uh, nerve involvement, particularly like on a cauda equina. Um, and so, uh, you know, in the brain itself, it can often just cause a viral meningitis. It doesn't have more of a specific imaging pattern, which is why I didn't necessarily show an example. But but the main thing to think about in the brain itself is like a viral meningitis. But remembering the involvement, um, you know, of the orbits and also the involvement of the spine and the and the nerve roots in the spine um, with CMV. But yeah, very good point um, that that's another infection to con to think of in our uh, immunocompromised patients. Thank you. I think those are the questions for now. Please feel free to uh, send any last uh, minute questions as we wrap up. But thank you for tuning in. Um, we appreciate the questions. This is very good and a very thorough lecture. So thank you, Dr. Farid. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And again, um, you all have my email and Twitter handle. So uh, I look forward to hearing from you. And thank you, Isaiah, for uh, um, moderating. And thank you to Dr. Raihani, who, who's, you know, the mastermind behind this wonderful organization. Thank you, Nikki. This was an excellent talk. I was look, I was uh, hearing to it and it was you, the way you described everything was so excellent. And I just want to read out a few of the comments because I think you can read them too, but people, people really liked it too. I think the way you simplified the concepts, it was excellent. You know, Dr. Enrico Mandura from Mexico is saying excellent lecture. Congratulations. Dr. Idun from Ghana says great lecture. Uh, uh, Dr. Farid, thank you very much. Then we have Dr. Carmen Julia Ramirez, uh, who says, hola, buenos dias. My Spanish is pretty bad, so I'm just going to say <laughs> gracias at the end, and I won't butcher that beautiful comment. Um, and then Dr. Jorge Hernandez from Mexico says, excelente, thank you. Uh, Dr. Asifa says, a very educative lecture. Dr. Rifat Abdullah says, says, I think that was a question which Izzy already read. Dr. Rifat Abdullah says, says, thank you, and very educative lecture. More and Nora Gher from Kenya says, wonderful presentation. Rajesh from India says, really excellent. Thank you. Dr. Samira says, thank you for an awesome cases and lecture. So really nice feedback from everybody. And we really appreciate you. This. You're such a thank great you. educator. You have done so much for Health of the World. And I know you did the case conference for Ethiopia too. So thank you so much for doing this for us. We really appreciate thank it. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. And I uh, hope to see you guys again in the future. Thank you so much. Thank yes, you all. Absolutely. Have a wonderful day. You have Bye. a wonderful day too. Take care.